Welcome everyone to our community check-in today, June 24th, 2020. Excuse uh, apologies for the glitch and at the same time, if you hear my wonderful son, apologies for him. He just um, started talking with a friend. Um, but yeah, today we're going to be talking about uh, public art and uh, we're going to have some incredible people come talk from different angles. Um, I'm pretty excited to get into this conversation, especially now when we're as a country, we're looking, we're revisiting like who we're actually celebrating and like past generations um, definitions of public art, especially like uh, sculptural art, right? Sculptures and the such. And, um, and even without that, we've been in the industry looking to see exactly what do we mean when we talk about public art? Um, is it uh, art in the public commons? Uh, you know, what exactly defines public art? And um, and it's a wonderful conversation that is ongoing and we're gonna talk to three people um, who come in it from different angles. And, uh, but before we go any further, I wanted to just recap and let you know who we are at the Mass Cultural Council. Um, we are, this is a community's check-in. We are the community team at the Mass Cultural Council. Mina, if you can go back to that other one for a second. Um, <laughs> we don't like looking at ourselves, but this is our team. We have two program managers, Lisa Simmons and myself, um, two pro uh, four program officers who work with local cultural councils and assist with cultural districts. Uh, my main focus are the cultural districts um, programs, and then Lisa also uh, manages the team but also works with festivals. Um, and the way we are split up is as such. Um, we break the Commonwealth up into these regions and Officers will have three, and then um, some of us will have two, and you'll see it there with the names next to it. Um, and then the lightly shaded ones is a brand new map that we made because last week we designated Fall River as our 50th cultural district down in this red area here. Um, and that is who we are, but a lot of our LCC people already know that. Um, today's agenda has our regular legislative update from Mass Creative with Tracy Konopinski, um, and then, and then um, three, three, three activist organizers, municipal officials, artists, creatives, um, and it's Crystal Chandler from Medford, Marie Lauderdale, and where, uh, where, where, no, and then <laughs> and Karen Goodfellow. Uh, Director of Public Art for the City of Boston. And we're just gonna jump into it. And if I can say, because we're talking about public art, I would ask that if you know of any public art happenings while we're here, you know, just throw it in the chat because we're gonna make the chat available to everyone. If you know of any call to artists, please put it in. Um, we have a couple that, we, that we're holding back. And then as, um, as the everyone speaks, we're, you'll see the chat fill with relevant links and at the same time if you have a question feel free to put it on the Q&A or the chat. Um, we have people looking at that and um, if there is a question at the end of someone's whatever I will ask those. If not we'll just go to the next one and we will get questions in at the end. So with that um, Crystal please co-founder of Mobilized Medford and media producer. Um, and I have to tell you, Chris, I was in Medford last week and I fell in love with the Salem Cemetery. And not only that, the Salem Street Cemetery, but not only that, the fact that you have like that, that one really great like plaza area just outside. And I've never seen like the cem a cemetery be the focal point <laughs> of a space like that. And I thought that was pretty awesome. But, um, but yeah, please, uh, if, I think Mina has the slides for you if you want, but um, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I can share my screen. Um, the slides are, are mostly for folks to take a peek at because um, I think looking at a talking head sometimes gets boring. Um, let's see here. Share that. Can you guys see the slides? Okay, perfect. You can see me. Oh, let's see. You see clicking through it, right? Okay, perfect. Awesome. Um, thank you so much. I really appreciate, um, you know, the, the time and space to be here and just chat a little bit about the work that I'm doing. Um, I apologize for background noise. I live on a very busy street. Um, it's the quietest place I can find. Um, but um, my name is Crystal Jam. My pronouns are hers. Um, I just want to take a moment to actually kind of go through, uh, you know, what art looks like um, as we're capturing it through the lens of history. 
Um, and I want to kind of talk about three main things, photography, videography, and podcasting, um, which are a, my specialties, but also three things, um, or three, three media, I should say, that um, are really capturing, um, you know, everything that's happening in the world right now. Um, so if you take a look at the two photos, or the four photos, I should say, at the bottom of the screen, you know, it's hard to tell sometimes which ones are from, you know, the 60s, right, and which ones are from today. And I think that's so important when, um, when I think about, you know, art and, and, and capturing it. Um, I uh, put together a rally lab two weeks ago, actually, my goodness, time flies. <laughs> um, but a rally in Medford um, around not only Black Lives Matter, but also policing in Medford, as well as um, schooling and just making big changes there. And I think a lot of times when we think of public art, we think of um, outdoor spaces, we think of, um, you know, maybe murals and things like that. But I also want to kind of expand our, our idea and our vision of what public art can be um, and also think of it as, as also capturing it as well. So um, if you go through some of these photos, um, you know, again, this is the 60s, right? And this is literally um, two weeks ago. I think part of what's really important with um, actually capturing a lot of these demonstrations, um, especially with not only Mobile Life Medicine, but Black Lives Matter, is that we're capturing real life history um, as it's happening. And I think something that's really important about that is that if you think about, you know, history and how it's been told in this country, um, it's really been told through one lens. And I think what we have today is the opportunity to expand that lens, to actually give everyone a lens so that we can, um, you know, actually capture um, uh, the, the reality of history, right? And also preserve it. And I think a lot of times we do that through photography. So um, these photos are by um, one of our photographers from Mobilize Medford named Catlin. Um, and so I think aside from just the, well, let me rewind a little bit. Aside from just the photography, um, we also have the ability to capture color as well. That's the other point I wanted to touch upon that, you know, the, the, the vibrancy, right? Like the, the, the colors, the, um, just all of the, the visual aspects um, are so important when capturing, um, you know, movements like Black Lives Matter, Mobilize Medford. Um, and I think about, you know, the future as well and how, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like how history will actually tell itself. I think about a lot of the history that we learned in schools, you know, and how it was, again, very one-sided and, you know, it may not have been captured from um, all of the, all of the different perspectives that were actually present. Um, but now we actually have the ability to do that. So um, I think this will actually help us in the future just to kind of create a more um, equitable world, but also a world that, um, you know, tells, tells the story of exactly what happened and not just the perspective. Um, so that's one part of it. These are just some photos from different protests and things like that around the Boston area. Um, I'm also part of Mass Action Against Police Brutality as well. Um, and so I think this is just part A, right? I, I only have like a certain amount of time, so I want to make sure I'm capturing um, all three of these. So this is part A. Part A is the fact that we have the ability to capture photos, right? Because we've always been able to do. Um, we went from black and white, we moved forward to color photos, um, and then we moved forward into, um, of course, the way that it was but that's okay. Um, we moved on into audio and visual. Um, I don't know, Mina, if you can speak, you queue it up, but um, I think that's another component as well, having the ability to, um, to take video and use it as, um, oh, there we go. See if I can it. This is like so weird not having like participation for me. <laughs> but um, so I, I, I wanted to show that clip because I think 
you know, a component of um, public art is, is where you can access it. Um, and actually having the ability to access, um, you know, things like photography, videography, and, and, and things like that are not only in these public, actually public spaces, but it can also come to you as well for folks who aren't able. So it makes it a lot more accessible um, by using things like social media. Um, and with that too, I think we've also expanded um, into, well, I should say come back full circle um, back into the audio space again. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about um, audio art and podcasting because this is really where I'm kind of like my love is right now and where I'm really focusing at the moment. Um, so if you guys are like used to, to, you know, regular podcasting, a lot of times they can be like really monotone and very, um, you know, just kind of one-sided stories and things like that. But I think the beauty of podcasting in uh, different spaces is that we have, um, you know, folks who are capturing, again, capturing history in real life, in real time, and also using it as, um, you know, this free accessible online audio, like database diary system. Um, and so these are a few of my um, podcasts I listen to on a regular basis. And this is um, important because each of these is capturing a different part of um, of history right now. It's capturing, um, so for example, the friend zone, they talk about mental health, mental wealth, mental hygiene, which is like, love those three put together. Um, but they're capturing it in real time, right? They're giving real time tips. They're giving, um, you know, exactly what's happening in regards to, to mental health, wealth, and hygiene um, right now. Same thing for the Read podcast. They do it more with pop culture, right? And what's happening right now. Imagine if we had, um, you know, a podcast or, or some type of like audio journal from, you know, a hundred years ago um, that really captured everyone who, um, who was around at that time, you know, some of our, our ancestors and our elders. Um, but same thing for mental, um, not mental health, sorry, for therapy for black girls, they capture mental health as well. And with that, I think, again, same thing, it gives people the access to, um, to have these free online resources um, that are not only um, free, of course, but, <laughs> but they're also um, accessible. They, they, they provide real um, you know, information, real resources from people who look like you, who sound like you, who um, have the same background as you. And I think there's something like so beautiful in that, to be honest. Um, because I can go to any podcast, any one of these, right? Getting grown, you gay aunties, right? Which is another one of my favorites, which is more about like queer adulting. Um, and actually have, you know, I can go back, you know, to 2016, an episode in 2016 and, and see what they were talking about then um, and see how it's applicable to my life right now. Or, um, or maybe it's not applicable to my life and it's maybe just learning about, um, you know, what is um going on with somebody else's life right it helps us to also connect with one another um so like long story short i know I only had like 10 minutes or so i'm not sure how many minutes this has been but um i just wanted to kind of like overall like the goal that i want to kind of get across is that um audio visual um you know and also motion pictures like video and stuff like that um we're expanding exactly um, who can access it, right? We're giving everyone, you know, these free online like resources and tools and things like that to capture, um, you know, their life, to capture what's happening in the world around them as well. And I think what's going to be amazing about that when we look back, you know, with five years, 10, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now is that we have, um, you know, these, these permanent, um, you know, accessible, I don't know if you want to call it database, a diary, or whatever it may be, um, that not only live online and can be used in, pub in actual public spaces, um, but they're just going to live on forever. So, um, yeah, that's what I have for you guys. And I have my um, contact info there as well. I don't know if that was my full 10 minutes, but I don't want to go over time. <laughs> Oh, no, I can't hear you. <laughs> Some of the most poignant things I ever said have been on mute. Um, <laughs> but um, I was just going to say that uh, 
when Nina and I were um, discussing this and and just the thought of um, the protests and the rallies as uh, as public art was so strong. Like I was like, yeah, of course. And um, thank you for um, visualizing that for us. And I think uh, I don't have an image of it, but if you wanna, um, I don't know if it's you or me, if you can unshare that um, that screen or stop sharing. Um, awesome. But uh, I think people know, like, have seen like that image of a of um, a statue. I forgot whose that's completely covered in writings in the evening with a projection of Harriet Tubman. Like, so the concept of projection, the concept, the concept of sound. Um, I attended the first rally um, by um, uh, against mass incarceration, um, or the the group over in um, over in the South End, and and the truck with the music was just um, incredible going through the streets. Um, and, uh, and similarly in 2017, I'm gonna put the link up here, but Northeastern University, after the Women's March in 2017, they, they collected as many of the protest signs that had been used that day um, that they can find that people just discarded and they created an archive Photograph, digitized them, and so the link is to the archive, which is just incredible. Um, and so the more people start thinking like that, both like as Crystal, as you were saying, like through video, audio, projections, it just really, um, it just really creates for a wonderful, just like document of the time. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally agree with you on that, and um, I think you know, just to echo everything you were saying. You know, this is really like gonna also help us push um, history forward. You know, I'm like really excited to see what the future is gonna be now that we have the opportunity to not only have like actual public spaces and you know audio and visual and all these other um, mediums, but you know just what what history is gonna say about itself when we when we look back this time because we're we're literally living through it right now. So pretty cool. Awesome. Thank you so much. And. Um, yeah, if people like at the end hit us with questions, I'm more than happy to put them to people. Uh, and so now we're gonna go over to what this generation um, sees. Like my generation was more like these sculptures, these big celebrations to war and you know white supremacists. And and now we're looking at there's a whole generation that's that's looking that when they think of public art, they think of um, huge murals, right? And Massachusetts is incredible in its mural tradition with cities like. Uh, oh my God, Boston, Salem, Lynn, Worcester, Haverhill, like you can name them. And these are all cities at 80,000 plus, but in, in where, 10,000, population 10,000, um, Marie Lauderdale and Workshop 13 are starting something um, that, because people are like, well, how do we get to that, right? And so with that, I give you Marie Lauderdale. Um, she's the executive director of Workshop 13, and I think you have your own slide deck as well also, right? Hey, hi, thank you so much. That was great. Um, I just want to mention that we, Workshop 13, uh, recently got to participate in our local rally. Um, when we heard that it was happening, we jumped on board right away and we came down with several tables full of um, materials for poster making and it was absolutely wonderful. I mean, there were so many people who came up and said, thank you, I forgot to bring my poster. And some who had their poster came to make more. So it was really, yeah, it was a, a fantastic, um, a fantastic day all around. So yeah, we're really great, to, thankful to be part of that. So, okay, so let me share my screen. Um, let's get this up real quick. All right, just one second. Um, okay. Uh, okay, can you guys see that? Okay. Present. Okay, so hi everybody. My name is Marie Lauderdale and I'm the executive director of Workshop 13. Um, and today I'm going to tell you a little bit about Workshop 13 and who we are, where we are, and then talk about two public art installations that we've recently led. So first, we are a cultural arts and learning center located in the town of Ware, Mass. So 
Um, we have three locations, uh, Workshop 13, which is a multi-use visual and performing arts space. We have Artworks, which is a fine arts gallery and gift shop located around the corner on Main Street. And we have Clayworks Community Ceramic Studio. And Artworks and Clayworks are very new. We just opened those in 2019. So um, yeah, it's been challenging, but fun. Um, so our programming is organized in two main themes, community engagement and fine arts instruction and exhibition. And um, our mission includes many things, but one part of it is that we strive to improve the health of our community through arts-driven re revitalization um, projects and programs. So here's, here's who we are, just so you kind of get a visual of it. This is our main building on, on Church Street. Uh, and here are artworks and clay works, which are located on Main Street. So a little bit about the town of Ware. We're located in the impoverished rural corners of Hampton, Hampshire, and Worcester counties with a largely white population. Um, I think as you had mentioned, we have uh, a population of just under 10,000 people. Um, our downtown area has been designated slum and blight with a high rate of opioid overdose per capita. It is, however, on the rise with many new businesses um, that have recently come to town and, of course, a thriving arts community. So we're proud about that. Um, and Ware is also a center for commerce with approximately 15,000 cars that uh, pass through Main Street each day. So now on to Main Street. Okay, so this is one section of Main Street in Ware. And in 2016, a fire tore through these, uh, these buildings and displaced all these bu uh, businesses on the lower level and all the residents on the upper level. Um, so, and in, in these, leaving these spaces uninhabitable. Okay, so now fast forward to now, um, three years later, these buildings are still, um, still nothing has been done. They are, um, they're a big eyesore and embarrassment to the town. And it's one of these things where, you know, it's kind of a running joke when you drive down the, the street and where you kind of look left, don't look right, <laughs> you know, like, let's just try not to, let's, let's not look that way because it's, yeah, it's, it's not pretty. Um, so, um, yeah, workshop 13, you know, we were looking at this and thought, wow, you know, going back real quick, this is a perfect canvas for some art. So we contacted the owners of the buildings and, um, uh, well, first we contacted the town of Ware and the building inspector and kind of said we, we'd be interested in putting some art up here. And they were 100% on board with that. Um, and then our next step was to contact the owners and through this process, we found out that the owners were not in compliance totally because um, here a few of these spaces like this one in particular, it was boarded up, but in the, the, over the years, these boards had come down in a storm and the owners didn't bother to repair them. So now you have this with like broken you know, glass and so it was unsafe. Um, so we reached out to the owners and said, hey, we'd like to put some, some art here. And we were sure to make sure, well, we are, careful to make sure we called it temporary art um, because these these buildings though most of them are um, either well some of them are I'm not sure if they're completely condemned but they would need a lot of work for someone to to move into them um, so we didn't want to you know put anything permanent in case someone a business would come in and move into here so um, yeah so we offered the owners um, the opportunity to, well, we said we, we'd like to put some art up here and in doing that we'd also be um, helping you out because we'd, um, by putting up pl the plywood, you would be in compliance with the town regulations. And um, they didn't care, to be honest. They just said, fine, whatever, make sure it doesn't fall down to hurt anyone. <laughs> and that was pretty much it. So, um, yeah, so our first project, uh, we started in April of 2019, and this was um, it was a community mural that um, was inspired by Kelsey Montague's "What Lifts You Wings." So this project um, isn't isn't new. You've probably seen these wings. Um, you know these are th these were her original ones in New York City, but since then this is many um, towns across the the world really have um, oh kind of made their own wings in different ways. So town schools, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not new, but um, it was something that we thought we could um, 
we could do with our resources and uh, budget, more importantly. And I think the way that we we did it was somewhat different than what other, than certainly than how Kelsey Montague does her wings or anyone else. So, um, so what we did is we asked local schools and business to, businesses to participate by decorating a wing or uh, or yeah a feather or a bird, and um, we dropped off packets at schools, at restaurants, at you know, banks and ask them, you know, with this cover letter saying, you know, when you're on your break or, or um, when you have a chance, just, you know, decorate this any style you want, anything that lifts you, just, you know, in any medium, and then call us and we'll come back and pick up the packet. So that's what we did. And we ended up getting a few hundred pieces or two, I think about 200, uh, 220 or something like that pieces, which was, which was fantastic. And, um, Oops, sorry. Oops, sorry. Keep going ahead here. <laughs> and the local printer, who right here, this is the the local printers. They happen to have a um, a restaurant directly across the street from the location uh, that I showed you in the picture, the the main street location. So their patrons have to look out the windows at that eyesore. And so when this opportunity came up for them to donate some materials, they, they said, oh, we'd be happy to if it's gonna, you know, if it's gonna improve the look of that building. So what they did is they scanned each of these pieces and um, onto a vinyl adhesive back paper and made it so that we could just go in and peel them off. And this was ac actually very helpful because we were able to duplicate them and, um, do them in a mirrored image. So for instance, these, these ducks, if they're, if all the birds are flying to the right, it would have been hard to put the mural together. So yeah, so they were able to duplicate those for us, which was awesome. Um, yeah, so now we have, we have these pieces. The next part was um, putting it together. So we, uh, we approached Lowe's, uh, our local Lowe's and asked them to donate the plywood and the paint, and they happily did that. And then we constructed the wings in the Grand Hall of Workshop 13. Um, so it took us about a week to do, and this was all put together by Workshop 13 artists and students. And um, I mean, you know, and this was, it was a great project because it's people of really all ages and abilities. Um, you know, we have, this is Gary Lippincott, who is a world-renowned fantasy artist who's working with these children who are in a um, arts art exploration class. So, you know, it was, it was really a collaboration of, of many different people. Um, yeah, so we had the fun challenge of collecting all these pieces and then trying to tie them together. And if you can see, um, the way we decided to do that was through Zentangle. So anyone who came through the door, we handed them a paint marker and said, fill in a space, any space. So it worked. Um, okay, so here's our wings. So we erected them on uh, Main Street in April of 2019 and um, it encouraged people to visit them, take a picture, share on social media with what lifts them. And the purpose of this was to first, you know, um, sort of cover up the eyesore but it also, um, it also did bring attention to that side of the street, where as I mentioned, usually people would kind of look the other way. Now they're actually looking, looking at that side saying, hey, those are great, but what about the rest of those buildings and who owns that? So it's really started to spark some interest in those, those spaces, which I think has been positive for the town. Um, yeah, so I, hundreds of people have uh, taken a photograph of it and shared it on social media with Wet Lips Them. And it's been overall just, you know, very well received. Um, and what people came, what people said when this went up um, was, what's next? So, um, and that brings us to our current installation. Oh, so by the way, just to talk real quick about price. Um, as I mentioned, we, this was done, um, the material, the wood, the plywood and the paint was donated. The printing was donated. Um, I think we spent under, it's probably around $200 on this project with paint markers and, you know, nails and screws, things of that nature. But um, as a result of this, like when we, um, uh, as we were doing this, I, I promoted it every day on social media. So I shared it with, um, to kind of build up to the actual installation itself. 
and each time with a donate button. So we easily covered the cost of it and then some. And um, since then we've, we've uh, since erecting this, we've also seen an increase in, um, uh, in members of Workshop 13 and um, uh, students. So it's definitely been good marketing for us, um, even though that wasn't the intention. So, um, okay. And uh, so next, um, oh, okay. So this is now fast forward to this year. Um, so this is the public, the installation we put up during COVID. Um, so this was originally supposed to happen during Art Week, but since Art Week was canceled, um, we put it off of, uh, uh, a few weeks. And we, we still did it, but we just didn't do it um, during Art Week. So, all right, so tell you, let me get to my notes. Um, okay. So yeah, during closure, our, we thought the best way to stay connected with our, our um, community was to was through public art because it's outdoors and we you know and we had this project in mind for the space. So it was, you know, we were really happy to be able to continue to do this. Um, so what this is, is eight local artists um, painted masterpiece portraits from home um, and it's a play on words. So if you live in the town of Ware or work in the town of Ware, You've definitely heard it. Um, you even mentioned it earlier. Where, where? <laughs> it's kind of a, a running joke. Um, okay, so first we started by prepping the storefronts, just painting them black. And this was pretty easy to get a bunch of volunteers because the kids were out of school. Um, parents were quite happy to have their middle schoolers come down and um, volunteer to do some, some work outside. Um, so first we started by painting the plywood black and uh, and each time we did something it was you know again a big share on social media and to kind of rouse excitement for the the installation itself so this was phase one and then phase two um, about two weeks later we came in and we painted the question marks and exclamation marks to um, again just rouse more interest in the project and you know people were getting really excited by this stage like oh i wonder what they're going to put there so yeah it was a lot of fun um, and then, uh, meanwhile, artists painted these masterpiece portraits at home. And um, really, we had some ideas uh, that we thought would work here, but a lot of these artists just, you know, they either chose one that we had in mind or they said, oh, I'd really love to do um, like this, this painting, for instance, which is by uh, William H. Johnson. It's not so well known, but we really liked it and we thought it would work well there. So. Yeah, and as you can see, some of the artists even had their kids helping, so. Okay, so here's the installation. Um, so we, get to my notes here. Um, okay, so starting in May, we began unveiling these portraits every day on Facebook Live. So um, I think I started with the first one, which was the Mona Lisa to, um, uh, we did that that the that first Facebook live video was just that video and then after that we hung um, two at a time and then the last day I think we had three so um, yeah and that was that was fantastic I mean for us uh, you know I think some of those Facebook live videos have been viewed like 7,000 times which is huge for us I mean we're, we're pretty small so you know that that really was pretty exciting but here's the installation I'm going to play it now. So, um, so as you can see, it's um, replicas of masterpiece portraits. <laughs> and uh, you have um, <laughs> Van Gogh asking where and this Picasso saying where is in the town. And um, here, this is a Monet, so she's asking in French. And next to each, uh, next to each, each painting is a little description of the art, uh, of the original and the artist uh, who painted it. So part of this was also that, you know, during COVID everything's closed, our museums are closed. So we kind of created this outdoor walk, which we hope people, um, you know, could come and enjoy. And it has been, yeah, it's been, again, very well received. Um, so here it is from the back. So you see here are the wings 
And then here's the newest installation with the Mona Lisa located just around the corner. Um, and these, so just to be clear, these were just done on plywood with acrylic paint and several layers of polyurethane. So um, let's see. Um, yeah, I feel, I feel like I'm waiting for people to ask questions, but no one's going to ask questions. Okay. Um, so the, yeah, all in all, I mean, this has been a lot of fun, but one thing I, I really want to, to make super clear is that um, all of these are temporary. You know, if businesses come in here and say, oh, we're going to open, you know, a flower shop here, these are, these can come down just like that. I mean, it's just, they're just screwed in, um, you know, plywood onto plywood, very easy. Um, but for now, it at least gives the town something to, you know, to look forward to in the wings. They've all often been, you know, people reference them and say, you know, it, we're, it's like a, a phoenix rising from the ashes. It brings new light and hope to this dismal, dark place. So, um, and you might be looking going, okay, but what about the top window? So this is phase two. We do have a plan for this. And again, the, the printer who is directly across the street from us, who has to look at this every day, has offered to print, um, oh, like either stickers or vinyl or something um, to go in these windows. And we have a local illustrator who's designing that now. And it looks like it will probably be um, some sort of a silhouette because we, we want this to look as though um, um, that it could be, a, it could be a usable space. You know, this could be an apartment up here. So maybe a silhouette of um, someone painting in an easel or, you know, um, a child doing homework or something. So yeah, that's kind of the idea, but we haven't settled on that yet. Um, oh, okay. Oops, sorry, going back. So um, yeah, this, so we have, we have several more things planned um, for uh, more art in this space. And um, this has also inspired other businesses on Main Street to add art to their windows. So we have, um, this is one of our students who re graduated from high school this year, Sophie, and she was asked to um, paint the window of the Ware River News. So this is the, just down the street from the wings and the, um, the Ware Ware installation. And this is the, uh, the Quabbin Tower. So it's kind of a landmark for us. So yeah, so I think people are kind of getting excited about this. It has certainly changed the perception, started to change the perception of the town of Ware, which is, um, which is a great thing. Um, so yeah, I guess a few things to, um, to just make sure I note that we, the town of Ware does not have a public art planning committee um, or any kind of public art policy as of now. So any of this art that we put up, um, we've done so, but we have to be responsible for it. So if it's damaged, we, you know, we'll have to replace it or repair it, what have you. Um, however, this, you know, I can see this changing soon because as I said, this is becoming, um, people are starting to see the benefit of having public art on the street. So, you know, we can only hope. <laughs> Um, let's see if there's anything else. Um, yeah. No, I was just going to say thank you, Marie. Um, what you call it only because of time and I, we actually do have questions, but, um, yeah. okay. what I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let Karen do her piece because it's, it's similar. And then the questions I think are play both for all three, especially like, I think you and Crystal both, um, Mention the concept of temporary, right? And just like, what does that mean? Like, with like, is is this type of outdoor public art? Per, you know, what's the concept of permanence within that, right? And I think that's a good thing to get into afterwards. I do. Um, thank you. That was that's incredible. And and take a peek at the at the chats when you can, because there was a lot of affirmation there. Um, and uh, but yeah, um, we're gonna go right into. Karen Goodfellow, who's the Director of Public Art for the City of Boston. Um, I think uh, one thing that, um, that I think Marie mentioned is like the concept of how the, the town eventually would get involved in this. And I think Karen has examples of, yes, she's in an office doing this work, but they don't have all the money. Sometimes a lot of their projects are, you know, actually come from funding from within other departments of the city who say, wouldn't it be nice to have this? Oh, we happen to have the, this office. So the benefit of having 
uh, a public um, our entity within the municipal structure. Um, and Karen, with that, I'll just uh, let you start. Thank you so much. Sure. Thanks, Luis. And thanks, everybody. I am, am going to try to share a tab of my screen right now. Um, oh, so let me see if I can do this. Um, might take me one second. Um, I don't know if it lets me do it like this. I just want to make sure I'm not sharing out someone else's emails. Here we go. Okay, so I think you should be able to see my screen now. Is that true? Can you hear me? We're good, Karen. Oh, you can. Okay, yep, sorry, I wasn't good. hearing hearing anything back from anyone. Um, okay, so um, it looks like we are at the. Let me just skip to the beginning. So I'm Karen Goodfell. I'm the director of public art for the city of Boston. Um, this is our public art team. I highly recommend talking to my colleagues Sarah and Trisha um, if you are interested in any of our work. Um, you can email us. Um, we're all first name dot last name at boston.gov, but you can also email BAC at boston.gov and you would get either, you'd get both Sarah and Trisha that way if you do have any questions about um, anything I'm going over. Um, the public art program has a, a board, a public board, the way we function, um, that was established in the late 1800s. And um, here you can see some of our members, including our chair and vice chair, Mark Pasek and Aqua Holmes. And so these are made up of local arts professionals um, and um, they're just really wonderful to work with and we meet at least once a month once a month in, at a public meeting and we make all our official decisions there um, but the the program is staffed by the mayor's office of arts and culture um, I want to talk a little bit very quickly about our um, different programs and so we you guys were talking about different funding opportunities so we do have a percent for our program um, which takes uh, one percent of the money we borrow uh, for um, capital projects. And um, so that is a, a sort of more traditional public art program. Um, and I'll just show you um, one of the projects we have going right now. This is a proposal. It's likely only that central piece by, um, by Joe Wardwell for the, the Roxbury Library in Nubian Square in Boston. Um, and Joe is partnering with um, a poet, Nakia Hill, who was one of our artists in residence um, and who works at 826 Boston. So he's working with her on um, developing the text, her poetry, um, and also partnering with some young people from 826 Boston on this project. So that is one example of the work we do that we um, have new funding from um, after we did the um, cultural plan um, when Mayor Walsh came in. We um, did, as a city, develop a percent for our program that we're still sort of working out the programming around. And we have a couple different um, other examples of projects we have coming up through that. Um, so that includes that um, on the top right, you can see something we're doing on Ruggles Corridor for the DeWitt, Pro Playground, uh, DeWitt Playground. You can see there in the back, we're gonna have some artwork there. Um, Marlon Forrester is working on that one with um, some architects. And we also had a call where doing some artist selection on the corridor itself to do some artwork to be integrated into the pathways. Um, we also have two artworks um, on the left. You can see the new Boston Arts Academy that we're going to be putting an interior and an exterior piece. And also um, on the bottom right, you can see Vine Street Community Center. So those are some of the projects that we have coming up. And it shows you sort of the uh, some example of the breadth we have coming up. The, I will mention that the um, Vine Street one, we have um, Destiny Palmer doing an interior piece. Um, and an artist actually out of Spain doing the piece in the exterior. Um, also something that's pretty popular across different communities is a, something like the paint box program where we're having artists paint utility boxes. We recently increased the stipend we give to artists um, from $300, which it had been since 2008 to $500. And we also sort of split it in two. So we get them a payment upfront so they can buy their materials. Um, and this, we have always sort of found different ways to fund, but now we're partnering with our streets cabinet, so Public Works and BTD, 
to find money to pay for this program. Um, and so it's an ongoing project and we've sort of uh, been changing it here and there over the years and we'd be happy to share more information with anyone if they're interested um, in learning more about how we're running that, um, that program in particular. Um, I also want to give an example of um, another kind of public art project that we uh, had a different kind of funding for. So this is Breathe Life. This is um, the first in the series of three that uh, are done by Rob Gibbs, Pro Black. He has, um, is actually working on Breathe Life 2 right now, um, which we've uh, started with a grant from us and the MFA has come in on, uh, come in on as a partner and is really excited um, at Madison Park, um, the Technical and Vocational High School. And um, the Breathe Life 3 was actually done um, before the second one being done now, and that was done on Tremont Street in partnership with Now and There um, with Rob Gibbs. But this one I wanted to highlight, we did it as a series of um, temporary public art, what we were thinking of temporary as, at the time, um, projects in um, partnership with the Department of Neighborhood Development. And so this again wasn't our funding. The, our, our partner came to us after they had gotten some money um, to do some improvements in the Grove Hall neighborhood and uh, we were able to put out the call to artists and we you know brought on community folks to um, join the artist selection committee we worked very closely with our office of neighborhood services to find the sites these are privately owned sites um, so we you know sort of staffed it and and did all that work um, and collaborated with the artists in getting them up but we really the funding came through the neighborhood development department um, and it was tied to other improvements that were happening in the neighborhood, which is really great, especially when we're talking about murals and are we really making improvements to, to our communities when we're commissioning those. Um, something else I want to highlight is that we've been working on some public art guidelines during COVID-19. Um, so this is um, just sort of an example. We've changed the format of this a little bit and it's something we're just beginning to share as artists are going out and doing work now. Um, we wanted to create these out of concern for their safety. So you can see we have um, two versions, one, one here for a single artist, um, so just someone working on their own on these kinds of projects that we just saw, and then one for artist teams where there are multiple people and really asking there to be a lead artist designated to um, make sure that everyone on site is being safe. Um, we also wanted to keep in mind the safety of the artist while doing these projects, so we had also developed some signage and we're updating our website, listing where all the projects are happening. Our concern was also um, about anyone passing by and feeling like they might be witnessing vandalism, who might call 911 and create um, an unsafe condition for the artist. So um, we really wanted to be thoughtful about their safety, both in terms of their health and just um, the potential racism of passers by um, seeing them at work. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is um, some upcoming meetings we have. Um, as you may have seen, we have been in conversation, like much of the country, about our monuments um, and the propriety of them and uh, what we want to do to assess them and the public dialogue we want to hold around that. Um, so actually our first public meeting is tomorrow at 6 p.m. Um, on the Emancipation Group. Um, and we are holding a follow-up meeting on that same piece on June 30th. Um, and a regular meeting is July 14th. So we have been um, taking a lot of public comment and also uh, pursuing it. Um, we have a survey up right now. If you are interested, um, we didn't add it to, to this presentation, but you could go to boston.gov slash public hyphen art hyphen under hyphen review. So public art under review, it's just um, a hyphen in between each of the, the words. And we have a survey posted there trying to assess people's thoughts on how we should handle the emancipation group. Um, and so it's not simply saying, should we keep this statue? Should we take the statue down? We're also asking, should we commission new work? Should it be permanent? Should it be temporary? If we keep it up, um, do we add interpretive information? Um, if we take it down, where should it go? Um, so we are really looking to have a nuanced conversation. Um, and to be responsive to um, the really incredible public input we've been getting largely through a petition, but there has been public interest in this statue for a long time. There have been, you know, articles written. We've had a lot of conversations about it. We had uh, commissioned a report in 2018 to look at our problematic 
controversial um, and largely just racist um, objects in the collection. And we have some recommendations on hand and now we are looking um, to further that information through these public meetings. So um, I think that is all I have in my presentation. So I will stop there. But if anyone has any thoughts or questions for me, I know um, it's about four o'clock and I'm going to have to hop out. Um, but I'm happy to take um, anything if there's something quick. Yeah, I think, um, Tracy, if it's OK, we'll just get one question with them and then we'll jump to our update. Um, and uh, I guess the one question that I'd love the three of you to, to chime in on, especially given that last note, Karen, um, and I'll start with you, is this concept of permanence with, with structures and how people feel because it's made out of like metal or you know concrete or something that, well, it's gonna be there forever, irrespective of the whatever, let's just put a plaque to give it context. Um, but if, if y'all can chime in on that and, and um, Excuse me, Marie, someone did ask like specifics about how did you pay for um, like the artists who did that? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, I can talk about for, real quick to answer that question. So the wings, um, we didn't pay an artist for that. That was like I said, uh, students, it was kind of part of our, um, uh, we incorporated it as uh, an educational tool for during some of our classes. So the instructors who worked on it um, were paid for their time as you know because they were teaching during it so that's one thing but the um, the portraits those were all um, the, the artist did that voluntarily so we supplied all the materials and um, uh, originally we had planned to do a fundraiser to cover the cost of that to pay the artist but because of COVID that didn't that didn't seem right but they all really wanted to still do the project so they just volunteered to do it um, so we didn't we didn't pay them, um, but for future for future uh, public arts, uh, we would be seeking local cultural council grants to do. Uh, we have a few other projects that we're looking for funding to um, be able to pay the artists for that. So, and and um, I guess my um, I would say for us whether it's permanent or temporary. Uh, it depends on where it's located. So those buildings, um, knowing that they could be occupied by a business at some point, so we would have to take that down. But it, um, some of those pieces would likely be moved to another location and end up remaining there permanently, who knows? Karen? Hi, so um, I will say just in terms of the question of permanence, I'd say we are, um, we build buildings and we understand that they might change at a certain time, but we build them to um, reflect the needs of the community in the moment and what we hope are the needs of the community in the future. I think those needs might change and we do so with the best of our abilities and the options available to us. Um, I think history and culture is certainly being made, um, whether we do so passively by accepting decisions um, by those who came before us um, or we are um, making sort of proactive changes to that. Um, and so I think, you know, whether we keep a statue up or we take it down, um, we, we do need to be really thoughtful about how it went up, what the story was, what the best intentions were of those people, what um, the bias and prejudices are that may have been um, part of their, um, the committee's decisions, the funders' decisions, the political decisions, the artist choices, there's a lot going in. Um, and there may have been a lot of complexity there that I think is good for us to understand and to consider as we um, review the choices that we have and that we make, as I said, either passively or actively. Um, and with that, I'm gonna um, shoot um, the sort of generic email um, and my own personal, not personal, but my own professional one into the chat. Um, I'm afraid I do have to jump off. Um, but thank you so much. Um, and please do join us tomorrow for our public meeting. The one tomorrow is at 6 p.m. And on, the, on Tuesday, we have another one at 5 p.m. if you're interested. Um, also, if you go to, um, to boston.gov, and I'll just type it out here because it's confusing, to our website, um, please find the survey and take the survey and share it with anyone um, you think might be interested. Perfect. And I think someone, but yeah, finish doing it because I think Veronica put the survey up. Oh, did you? Okay, case. thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I've... 
I'm not that good at presenting no, and seeing things at the same you're, time. You're perfect. Although I've gotten a lot of practice. Um, but thank you so much. It's good to meet you all and, and see those of you I've, I've met before. But thank you, Luis. You're very welcome. Thanks for stopping in. And um, Crystal, yeah, if, if you can chime in as well, then we'll um, finish with um, Tracy. Yeah, I'll just kind of, um, in terms of like permanence and, you know, preserving, I guess, a lot of this public art, um, I think at least for the, the, the mediums that I use, um, the online space is really where they become permanent when people are able to like digitize and, you know, put things up online. Um, I think also too, like the fact that folks are able to capture things on their own now, right? Like before we didn't have the ability to just like whip out a cell phone and capture 30,000 photos, which I do have on my phone right now, you know, so I can literally go back, you know, into my own archive. Um, so we're also, we also have the ability to create our own archives, um, which we didn't have the ability to do before. Um, even though I still do print out a lot of like my photos and things like that, because there's something really nice about a tangible photo. Um, but I also wanted to loop back around to the, um, to the electrical boxes that we just saw as well, because um, it didn't have to do with my presentation per se, but I did actually paint an electrical box in West Medford when I was in teenager, so talk to say high school, but um, it just made me recall that because that box during our rally, we actually drove right past the box. And I just remember like pausing, not pausing the whole rally, but just saying like, you know, look, this is what it means to be a part of the community that this has been here for the last decade or so. Um, and it looks like, you know, no one's vandalized it. I mean, it literally just says welcome to West Medford on it. So um, I think there's some permanence in using um, structures that have to be permanent, like an electrical box um, and making them actually like beautiful and part of the neighborhood. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to just mention was that, um, you know, there's also the ability of like um, uh, moving and like, what's the word? like. Uh, movable art, that's the word, <laughs> like movable art, um, because, you know, there are things like, you know, visual projects that you can take up and put down and things like that. Um, you know, two, three years ago, I did what you call the Dear Little Project, and, you know, that was an audio-visual project that gave affirmations to little Black boys and girls. You could literally, you know, put the photos up in whatever gallery you wanted, take them back down. I can mail them to you. You could put them up um, and take them back down as well. So I think there's different ways to preserve, um, you know, this art and it, not all of the art has to be um, temporary. So yeah, hopefully that answers the question. That's awesome. Thank you. That's awesome. Thanks. Um, art for all. Right? Um, and Tracy. Hey, look, Tracy's there. <laughs> She's ready. She's like, bam. Um, Tracy, thanks for joining us. Um, give us your your thing. Are you excellent? We want to make sure that this goes into presentation mode. Okay. Um, so um, I think it's really great to have all of the context that came before me um, because Mass Creative, as a statewide arts advocacy organization we can't do our work unless um, there's great arts and culture work happening all across the Commonwealth and the country and the world. So thank you for all of your, your work um, on the ground. Um, we work on the ground in a different way and I think of advocacy as a form of public art because organizing is an art and a science. Um, so um, I think just like um, art, um, we have to react to the world around us um, with both our art and our voice and just how we choose to spend our time. Um, and at Mass Creative, we've done that too. I mean, because we're an advocacy organization, we have to respond to the world around us, not just the art world around us, but the larger political world, the larger social world. And um, it goes without saying that we're kind of dealing, not kind of, we're dealing with two different crises right now. Um, there's the impact of COVID on the creative community, um, as well as everyone, um, and the economic impacts that come along with that and losing our creative spaces and our ability to connect in those ways. And then also with racial injustice and police brutality, there's just, it just compounds everything that we're dealing with. Um, but I think it's a moment where we have to say, okay, going back to normal, it's not really possible right now, <laughs> but we do have this opportunity to have radical hope and to say, yeah, things are really bad right now and I'm not sure how I'm going to rebuild. I'm not sure how I'm going to recover. I'm not sure how I'm going to reopen, but another future is possible. I really believe in that. Um, I'm rereading um, Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower and 
folks haven't read it or need to read it again, now is the time. <laughs> um, absolutely. Um, and so um, I think um, I definitely channel her and um, in our work at Mass Creative um, so that we can imagine something, figure out what our role is, and do it. Um, so um, I want to share a couple of resources in the time I have. Um, so um, Mass Creative, we um, came across this resource with, with um, possibly people have seen it before, Deepa Iyer, who works for the Building Movement Project and has a project called Solidarity Is. Um, she's a frontline worker and created this um, map um, of your social roles during crisis um, after 9-11 when she was figuring out what her role was in responding to the crisis and then redeveloped it after the 2016 election and also redeveloped it for COVID and after George Floyd's murder and um, political uprising and social uprising. Um, so what this does is um, it has a set of values in the middle and so we did this with our team. So we put mass creative values based on our mission, vision, and values in the center. And we said, okay, there's 10 roles. Um, there's a lot of roles that people are playing, but what are, the, what are the roles that we at Mass Creative, both individually and collectively, need to play? And so for us, based on our mission, vision, and values, we are weavers. So we make those connections between people and policies and things that are happening. We're storytellers. So we help to lift up the stories of the creative sector. Um, and we're builders. So we help to create infrastructures for people to find their role, take action, and make change happen. So I highly encourage you to look at this. It's so simple. It's got a reflection guide. Um, Deepa is also doing a bunch of Instagram lives that are really great. And she's working with a set of social workers across the country as well um, to use this. Um, so as we did that, we said, okay, what's our role? Um, we run campaigns and there's an election coming up. So if there's anything that we should be doing is doing everything that we can do to make sure that our elections this fall on the state level, on the local level, on the federal level are as representative of the people who make up our commonwealth, who make up our communities, who make up our country. And that really means that we need to reach people who are underrepresented and don't always see themselves playing a role in democracy or in the census. Um, so this is our campaign called Create the Vote. We launched it in 2013, but this year it looks a little different um, because, um, so in years past, it's really focused around engaging with candidates around arts and cultural policy. Um, that is um, a part of it, but really this is about um, increasing voter participation in the election by asking the creative community to step into your role as a civic leader and say, hey, we play a role in educating the public about elections, registering voters in a nonpartisan way, um, and helping to turn people out and make sure that they get to the polls. Because right, once you register someone, it takes a whole lot of work to actually make them feel comfortable and that elections are actually accessible to them. So. Um, I wanted to share just our goals and then a couple of things that you can do right now to engage on this campaign, which we literally launched just four hours ago. And so I, this is our first public presentation on it. So exciting. Woo! Okay, so this is our Create the Vote Steering Committee. We intentionally built our steering committee based on folks who do democracy work and do work with communities that are underrepresented in the census and don't have always have access to elections and um, to democracy. Um, so here they all are. There's some great folks. Um, hopefully we can share this slide deck so that folks can look through this as I whiz through. So the main goal of Create the Vote is to increase civic engagement and strengthen democracy. So we specifically want to reach the staff, board members, patrons of Massachusetts arts and cultural organizations, and then use those organizations to help who do the real work on the ground with underrepresented communities, right? We don't want like a bunch of white leaders being like, oh, let me help you vote. We want the actual people who are on the ground working with um, BIPOC young people, queer and trans youth, working class families and new citizens to um, merge our goals so that we can, um, we can achieve them together. Um, the second goal is to increase voter participation in the 2020 elections um, through nonpartisan activities. So voter education, voter registration, and voter turnout. So that's how we're going to do it. And then the last two pieces that are really sub goals is that we want to increase representative democracy um, through participation in the 2020 census. Um, so folks probably know that every 10 years there's a census um, where um, the population is counted. This includes um, 
it basically includes everyone who like physically lives in the United States. Um, that is the only requirement. Um, and so um, because of, co I mean, in general, it's really hard to count everyone. Um, there's lots of misinformation. There's lots of, um, there's lots of worry about what that means, um, for example, for immigrants and for their status. Um, and so we know that there's caution around it. And all of that is compounded by COVID because normally there's lots of people coming to your door to make it more accessible, to have it in multiple language, to have translators, um, to be able to do it. Um, and that is not possible because it's not safe right now. And so they've extended the census ten deadline until October. Um, and but we still need to do a lot to make sure that everyone is counted and that um, it's fair and representative of the people who live in the country. Um, the second, well, I guess the fourth piece. <laughs> so the last piece is really about the creative community is full of civic leaders, right? The, the work that we do, we are civic leaders. We bring people together. We have conversations about what's happening in the world around us. We reflect it back. We ask big questions. We're already civic leaders. There's lots of people who don't know we're civic leaders. <laughs> and so um, really this campaign is about positioning the creative community to be seen as a leader, as the leaders that we are in increasing civic engagement and strengthening our democracy because we don't often play in elections because we're worried about maybe um, making a board member angry or about are we, um, are we doing it in a legal way? So it's absolutely legal for nonprofits to engage in elections, but there's just some rules you need to follow like most things. Um, and so those are the goals. Okay, here are the things to do. Um, so today we launched the campaign with a pledge to create the vote. Um, which is um, asking individuals and um, organizations within the creative sector to pledge to um, increase voter participation through that education, registration, and turnout in a nonpartisan manner. Um, so you can take the pledge as an individual, as an organization, and check off what levels of engagement you want, because we want to cater it to what you are comfortable and what you um, are able to do with your capacity and your resources. That's the first thing. But then it's not just about taking individual action, it's about taking collective action, right? It's not just about us, it's about everyone around us. We got to share it out um, and help make that ripple effect. Um, so we've created lots of graphics, social media tools, emails, um, all these great templates um, so that you can, it's really easy to share. So we've got some sample graphics in here too. Yes, here is the toolkit. So um, we like to refer to this at, at Mass Creative as our toolkit is the Just Add Water, where we've got lots of templates. You just add water and it like literally grows. Um, we got lots of feedback that we make it so easy to engage in advocacy and that's what we wanna do. We know you're doing lots of work in your studios, um, you know, online virtually producing events. And so we know you don't have time to figure out exactly what words to write or what to do. Um, we wanna help you out. And obviously everything is editable to make it in your own voice and your own words. Um, I think I've totally run out of time, but <laughs> I just wanna share that we also work on arts education, which I think is a really important tool right now. Um, right now, like the state is figuring out how students are going to learn in the fall, if it's going to continue to be remote, if it's going to be in the classroom, what it's actually going to look like. And that's not just for in the school arts, but after school arts programs, um, you know, we, um, uh, they're, right, like arts educators are social workers, right, like they help, um, they help in so many ways um, in uh, making the language of art accessible in um, applying all the resources to you know students across the spectrum um, and so um, it's an equity it's an equity issue that was compounded by COVID um, and it's just come into even more of a stark contrast and so um, in terms of arts education there's a couple of things that we're following um, chapter 70 funding is the education funding that allows resources to be distributed equitably, equitably to school districts and then made a lot stronger by the Student Opportunity Act. But because the state and municipalities are figuring out how to balance their budgets with huge shortfalls and then increased expenses around sanitation costs, on that a lot of school districts are letting go of teachers, they're cutting programs because they're trying to figure it out. Um, but I, I think it goes without saying that like students, when they come back to the classroom, they're going to need more resources and more educators to help their social emotional learning um, than, than before. And so um, there's a couple of tools that we have put up 
Um, so we've got um, the most recent one is this action alert to protect education funding. So you can just put in your zip code, um, the form auto fills, you can edit it with your own story and then send it off. So um, if you are like, whoa, this is awesome. I love advocacy. Give me more. <laughs> this exists on our website under our COVID drop down. There's lots of advocacy opportunities. Um, and you can always reach out to someone on the Mass Creative team. We're largely run um, by some really, really dedicated staff and a squad of interns who are awesome. Um, so this is all of us. Um, and then if you want another bite-sized version of this, um, we do a weekly policy and action update every Friday from 9.45 to 10 to like launch you into your Friday. It's like, it feels like being shot out of a cannon, <laughs> um, but it's like short so that you're not on a, another long Zoom, even though I love long Zooms that are productive. Um, so if you're interested in that, we've got one this Friday. We're skipping July 3rd for um, lots of reasons and uh, we'll be back on the following week. So there should be links in the chat box for all of this stuff. So thank you, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Tracy. Um, I moved to Massachusetts in like summer of 2012 and, and shortly after that I, I met Tracy um, through her role at, at Mass Creative and um, she's leaving within the next month and um, I just want to thank you for being such an incredible um, creative and ally to creatives. Um, so huge. I touched the earth to everything you do for us and look forward to, to helping you whatever the next chapter brings, right? So. Thank you, thank you. I'm not disappearing. Don't you worry. <laughs> and um, thank everyone for hanging in with us. We, we only like three people left. Um, and I think those are the people who had to go earlier. Um, I had one final note with like temporary, you know, temporary, there are two wonderful things about temporary. It's like one, it's a really great foot in, right? Like once you say temporary, people go, all right, because they're thinking in their head, all right, this won't last forever. So it'll, it'll get you that project, right? You can do, a lot of times you can just like jump in and do something if it's temporary. And sometimes I did a project in Hartford, Connecticut, where I just put this huge eight by 16 mural in the atrium of the city hall which was super like you know just in your face and like really great imagery with this wonderful artist and i told them no it's temporary don't worry about it the thing was it was like four four by eight panels that were just super heavy um and it was there for 10 years and finally like the community said can we put that in a more permanent space so it's now being moved over to the library the main library branch and um and the artist is being compensated for for um, that quote unquote acquisition, um, all in the name of temporary. So um, Marie, the work you're doing is incredible. Um, I will leave the, um, like, if anyone has any final questions, I don't see any. Thank you so much. Um, this has been awesome. The notes, we, we will have the video up on YouTube. We will make the notes and the slide decks available as well as the chat. Um, for those of you who don't want to wait for the chat right now, go in and save the chat because it'll save to your own device. And if you go to chat, you should see three dots and then you just say save chat. And so then you can see it in these folders. So, but we will still have that for everyone. And with that, um, thank you. And I bid everyone adieu and a really great, wonderful weekend.